thank you. Uh, I sincerely hope that you can hear me in the last rows because I'm coming from the warm weather of Rome and here in Brussels already I made some a little bit of damage this cold. But anyways, I'm sorry to if you cannot hear me, please uh, raise your hands. Is the mic on? I hope so. Is oh, never mind. Yeah, yeah, this is the thing. Yeah, it has a green light, so I really hope it's it's a good indication that it probably is working. So, city of Bologna, 2015. Uh, they had a lot of road construction works uh, and of course just like with the any road construction site it attracts a lot of people a lot of old people who just go there and try to see and see if the if the road is being done correctly just like they used to do in their times and it's such a popular phenomenon i guess not just in bologna and not just in italy but all around the world but we have created this word which is called umarel and umarel means exactly this is the person it's a little man and it's the person uh, usually of old age, who goes and checks the work. And to give you a couple of facts about Umarels, 11,000 euros. This is the budget that the city of Riccione, just close to Bologna, allocated yearly to pay a stipend to these Umarels. Because they do provide a useful service to the administration. They do provide, and they serve as a double check to, <coughs> to ensure that the public works are, c are carried out in a, in a good way. And this guy here was the first one to be awarded the prize of Umarel of the Year, 2015. Franco. And uh, there was a, a nice celebration where the vice major uh, gave this award and nominated him uh, head of the road construction site for one day. But to introduce you now somebody who is definitely not an Umarel, uh, don't, don't say I ever made this metaphor, is my boss, uh, Diego Piacentini. So who is Diego Piacentini? He uh, was uh, the uh, senior uh, vice president of uh, Amazon and he took a two years leave to be tasked with uh, the job of digitizing and modernizing Italy. He was named commissioner for the digital agenda. So what did he do? He formed a team, a team of 30 super experts at the, as the, the press would define them uh, and tried to tackle this immense job. And while 30 seems like a um, medium to large agency, well if you put all of us in the same room or in the same slide it's not that many people. So in order to tackle this enormous task, uh, we set out some plans. And Diego thought, well, to be effective, we need to, be, we need to, to work uh, on, the, uh, on the infrastructure. We need to be plumbers. Uh, what do I mean by this? I mean, just like a plumber has make, makes his own job in your own house or in, in, in a building, uh, you will only know about the job that he did or, or she did when it was done not properly. Otherwise, it's hidden. It's in the foundation. It's in the infrastructure. And just like any good plumber at the beginning, uh, he started to write with the team at the three-year plan. He started to lay down the plans for what they would do in this, uh, in, in this program. And well, it's a rather uh, big document, which is also translated into English, but it's about 150 pages. So I'm not going to explain the whole plan to you right now. I'm just going to give you a very quick glimpse. Well. The first thing that was defined was the technology, of course, the technological platforms and infrastructure. The second part was about the processes, defining processes. And the third one were to decide tools that would embody those processes that were decided. And this is exactly where openness and hackability comes in. Because of course, technology is an enabling factor. You need to have enabling platforms which allow you to <coughs> to build something. So it needs to be generic, it needs to be API based, etc. But the real, the real key, the, one, the, the message that I want to explain to you today goes into these two levels, the processes and the tools. To give you an idea about the technologies, well, this is a very, very quick summary, but basically we created, uh, we created or, or we helped to, to, to build pro projects that were already ongoing about the identity. So th uh, giving a digital identity online, offline, on your ID card, uh, used with standard chipsets so you can build an open ecosystems around it or the anagraphical information centralized so you have APIs you can integrate better applications uh, then a second big chapter was made on platforms uh, such as the payment platforms or an API ecosystem where you have this pretty radical shift of um, um, no longer having a service being given to the users but starting from a set of APIs so that it can be integrated and, and the machines also in the public, in the 12,000 public administration that we have in Italy can talk to each other. 
and then of course a data and, and analytics framework so that uh, we can properly make use of all the big data that we are producing. And of course, all these technologies are great, but if we keep developing them the usual way, then we keep being in a world garden. So how do we create the open processes? Luckily for us, uh, we had already had start. We had this uh, digital administration code, which is a pretty, pretty advanced code in uh, as far as law goes. And, and this was the effort that was uh, put in place before we arrived in order to open up the processes. And to sum up the articles, there are two very nice articles, which Article 68, which says that all public administration have uh, to choose open source solutions first, and that all new code that is created for public administration should be openly licensed. But of course, this is not enough. I mean, sure, having a good law, having a good framework is absolutely essential. Otherwise, you don't have the freedom to implement new policies and new processes. But <coughs> good tools are as well. Because if you, don't, if you just provide the law and not the tools, then it's very hard for anybody to complain. Especially, think about the definition, all software should be openly licensed. What it means in, in a ju jurisdictionary system. <coughs> so we started to realize that we had to create tools and processes, and we did it with those key technologies that you saw in the three years plan. So by choosing those technologies and, and really eating our own dog food, we started to see how we could implement proper processes and tools. So we started to uh, work on how the source code was published and released, and we passed from something like this to this. Very uh, normal for you. Some, sometimes it was not very um <coughs> something very normal for the people who were working in, 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 uh, in the public administration. The documentation as well passed from a very long PDFs written in the forms of the law where you see uh, seen the, the, re the decree and seen the law to uh, read the docs. And of course, created a place where you can discuss all of your changes and where you can just hang out with fellow developers. But up until now, well, of course, this is modernizing, this is digitizing, but what, what is the real, the real innovation? I mean, really, we have seen this before. Uh, in the US, uh, there is 18F, there is, in France, a similar approach from the government where they try to publish all of their code on GitHub, they try to open source them. The real, the real change, and I think the real innovation that we're trying to bring forward, also, also communicating with our European partners, is this. It's, it's the same difference that has, is between uh, Android and Debian, to put it to, to an extreme, which both are open source, but you, you know there is a clear difference between them. And it's, of course, the open governance model. Where with the open governance model, the people from the community, whether they are individual developers, whether they are companies, uh, whether they are other actors, can actually uh, not only contribute and send pull requests and just watch from the outside, but also contribute, and if they wish, they can take responsibility for a few of the software that are used from everybody and from all the citizens. Think of it, for example, um, if I, we have released a toolkit for doing websites in an accessible way, which follow and respects all the guidelines, uh, what if I do a WordPress theme? Well, then this can be easily maintained from the community. If there is like some core WordPress developer, Italian, who wants uh, to maintain it, then this is something they can do. And of course, it doesn't need to be Italian. Uh, it, many of the technologies that we are creating are actually quite generic. The whole uh, framework about data processing and data analytics is completely generic. It uses Metabase, it uses Superset, it uses Jupyter Notebook. So those are all things that can be of value and that can be shared between the systems. And with the open governance model, we are giving power to the community. <coughs> Main challenge, of course, is then with the public administration itself because, well, there is some kind of fear that you need to overcome when you ask <coughs> people who are used to work in a very closed and locked environment and just release once every one or two years uh, to do development in the open. Sometimes from day one, sometimes after the day of the release, then you need to change a new mindset where if you open a pull request, that doesn't really mean like, okay, I'm intruding in your work uh, and stepping in your work directly. It's just like a pull request, and you, you have to answer that because it's somebody that can provide a useful contribution. Maybe they sent a patch and it's all wrong. You, you, you have to explain why. So it's a new mindset that needs to be put. And then, of course, you need to find workflows that work because 
if I'm just going to say, OK, you open everything up, and you don't provide them a framework in which they can work effectively, then this, this just impacts productivity. And they are going to hate you for that. So we started this community in, uh, with a large event on 6th, 7th of October, where we have 800 developers, uh, 27 cities in Italy. It was the largest uh, public uh, hackathon ever organized in Europe, uh, second larger, the largest in the world, because NASA be beat it. To, for <laughs> And where we kickstart this community, we asked for help to develop many of those components. And, all th and the developers who sent in successful pull requests uh, were, uh <coughs> were then accepted and were nominated as maintainers if they wished to, to, to be so, of course. <coughs> and for the future, uh, we are trying to now, are in the process where we already saw a model that is working, and we're in the process of uh, scaling things up. How do we do that? We are uh, writing national guidelines. And I want to explicit that when, once those guidelines are going to be published, they're going to be binding for all public administrations. So this is a document we're working on right now, and which will be open for comments by more or less the end of this month. And of course, all comments are, uh, are welcome in this sense. And <coughs> in these guidelines, we want to write things such as uh, you need to publish and put all your code on a collaborative platform of your choice. It could be GitHub, it could be your self-hosted GitLab, or Gitia, or Bitbucket, or basically whatever you want. And we're going to propose a model, a community working model. This is the GitHub flow. Uh, it, 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 should be, it will be something similar to the GitHub flow, where uh, you have several maintainers, and you have all public administrations working on the same code. The end goal is to turn all servicemen, all the people, all the coders who are already working for the public administration into real open source developers who know how to contribute upstream when they use upstream projects, who know how to publish their work, how to work together and cooperate. This is, of course, a pretty, pretty uh, challenging task, but I think it's a, it's a highly successful one. Another uh, key part of our strategy is the open innovation hubs. Uh, what is, what is an Open Innovation Hub is a way to stabilize uh, this uh <coughs> the culture of the opening even more. It's a series of places uh, which are created to promote the open culture in cooperation with the universities, in cooperation with the municipalities, in cooperation uh, with the local institutions so that they can form a group uh, about open source and open practices. And to be a part uh, to be a reference point for the public administration so that they can cooperate. So taking the existing community and leveraging on the, on the work of the, exist of, uh, of the existing communities who are, uh, that do and develop open source and give them a way to talk to public administrations. And on the other hand, for the public administration to have like some kind of feedback when they want to create new technologies or they have new ideas for the public, with the public. All of this, of course, in constant communication with the other European partners. We are speaking a lot with the French team. We're speaking a lot with the European Union, with the UK team. So to sum it up, just like Franco was given on that day the possibility of uh, driving the, the machine uh, for, uh, for making sure that the road was even, and his dream was fulfilled for one day, well, we hope that you appreciate and you can be our digital Umara for the next days. Thank you very much. So, do we have any questions for Ricardo? I could just wait for the question for the camera. Okay. Why is this? Yeah. Sure. Um, <coughs> you mentioned that you're using GitHub and Discord and Slack. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So in the national guidelines, we are not mandating any specific platforms, of course, uh, because it would be, I think it would be even illegal to do that directly in, in the national guideline. We are uh, just uh, giving the requirements for a platform. Uh, and then we are uh, quoting a few of the platforms 
uh, which uh, satisfy those standards. In the case of Slack, we have one for those key technologies that we created. So if you, if you just go on developers.italia.it, you have the button which is Slack, and then you can get your invitation. Um, for now, this, has, this was set up for the hackathon, so we wanted to keep it as free as possible. And then now we are having all the developers just be there and use that as a reference point. Um, the thing is, it's very, very hard to choose a good communication method. and. Uh, also, to maintain, uh, like you could go for a, a hosted solution such as Slack, and there you have uh, several competing solutions with pro and cons, etc. Uh, and you can go for your hosted yourself. Uh, we chose for a hosted solution because it was easier to set it up, and it was easier to maintain it in the long run. Um, because we, we need to stabilize this kind of effort. <coughs> Sorry, um, the. Uh, on GitHub, on the other hand, the Italia organization, just go github.com slash Italia. Uh, it's a completely free organization because all of the, the repositories there are completely public and open source. So there is no need to close it up. We, I can tell you what we did for Developers Italia, which is the part of the development of those key technologies, but then all the administration will be able to choose with basing, uh, based on their needs. Already we have some regions which are host their own software on uh, some kind of source for it, so uh, it, it really depends on the skills of the administration and, and what they want to do and what they want to invest. Okay, wait. First you, and then so I see many hands. This is... Uh, My question is, how will these projects affect the relationship with uh, contractors, especially large ones? I would expect that they not be super happy about the openness that these so, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so he says that um, most um, most contractors will not probably be happy about the openness uh, of those projects uh, and releasing them as open source. Uh, what I can tell you is that when, like, they are already obliged by law to release them as open source. Uh, because there is Article 69 which says all code made custom for the public administration should be released openly. Now, the definition of openly until now has been somehow problematic uh, because it was not never specified like, okay, what does it mean? Like, does it need just need to be free? Does it need to be under certain licenses? Does it need to give you any freedom? It was summed up in, a, um, it is called a reuse catalog where you would, um, you would be able to give it to other public administrations for free which is a little bit open source, but not exactly. So what we are doing is, by those guidelines, which will be binding for the public administrations, uh, <coughs> you will need to release it as open source. Uh, otherwise, you will not be able to participate in, to in, in, um, in the call. So it's, it, will be, it will be for new software, of course, because we cannot do it on, on the previous software, but all new contracts uh, will be made in this way. Now, this for the specific details, of course, you need to wait for the guidelines to be out and published, and of course there is a commenting work, so for this is for the exact details. But in general, I, I hope this answers your question. Yes, okay. okay, good. Okay, I see hands in the back. Okay, you, because... Um, you mentioned some forums and documentation. Uh -huh. Is that mostly developer-facing, or is that any aimed at uh, civilians as well? This is a very, very good question. So he was asking about uh, whether the documentation in the forum is just for technical development or also for this... Uh, general civilian documentation. Uh, so it started out for, um, the, the forum was uh, created for discussing the three years plan. So very, very much a civilian, um, well, quite technical, but still uh, pretty much, n n it was not documentation for the software. Um, then uh, the, uh, on the other hand, the read docs part, so the, the technical documentation, was created for the software. Uh, but now we are more or, more or less in the process of merging the two things. Uh, or we are using the infrastructure that we created for the technical documentation also, for example, to host uh, versions of the law. Uh, one very good example is the, that uh, digital administration code, which was the first law, which was put on GitHub, uh, completely version, and you, see, you can see all the diffs between the version from 2006 till the one which was passed just last December, and you can see how it evolves with regular git diff tool, uh, and then you, you can read it in uh, reader docs, etc. And the idea is to try to bring this forward more and more. 
Probably the interface will need to be adjusted because, of course, you are serving two different technical use cases, but we are going in, in this direction. And you have also to consider that most of the documentation for the technical part, of course, for the laws is in Italian, but for the technical part, we are trying to be as international as possible. Most of the documentation is actually in English. For, for example, about all the data processing is, is done like that. And it, it's also interesting to see that other governments are doing a some, some stuff similar to this. An example was the French government, which released the uh, software is called OpenFisca, uh, which is a Python package where they, they you can run simulations for your country. You, you basically write uh, Python classes, and <coughs> you, you define the fiscal system of your country, and then it's completely generic, and you can run simulations. You can see how to optimize taxes. You can propose the reforms, uh, and then see the impact of that. And we're working on this. We, we're also applying for a Google Summer of Code. And this is, for example, uh, if we get accepted as a Google Summer of Code organization, one of the challenges that we, we try to propose to adapt it for our fiscal system. OK, more questions? Um, to me, the scope of your program is not clear. So basically, does it only apply to software which is uh, developed on behalf of the Italian government? Or does it also apply to software which is processed and already like, uh, is offered? Does it then also like? Uh, <coughs> So you're asking about like okay. Uh, so you're asking about how what is the scope of the program? Is it just for new software, for old software, open source software? So the answer is uh, is different. So uh, Article 68. I, I I go back to the law. Article 68. You have to choose open source solutions first. What it means is I am a public administration, and I need a new piece of software. Uh, the first thing to do I have to do is I have to evaluate what is already present before asking for it to be made for myself. And if I find an open source package that is good for me or that can be modified for to suit my needs, I have to choose that. I am mandated by law to do that. If instead I choose to have something new made for me, then I need to create it and release it for everybody as open source. What we are doing is we are adding a collaborative model and an open way because until now it was open source like Android, okay, which is open source, but you just get a tarball every now and then. And said with this model, you are able actually to maintain it and create a community around that. A community which could be of other public administrations, citizens, uh, everything. For the governance question, if I, if I got it correctly, so asking, like, <coughs> who are you reporting to? We report directly to the prime minister. So this is the head of all the public administrations. So once we do all this work and we release this code, the presidency, the government, uh, the, the municipalities, the hospitals, the universities, uh, the schools, Everybody will be covered by this. Is it? Okay, so the question was, <coughs> if I <coughs> create a, a model where <coughs> you have to release as open source the software that you create, doesn't this, doesn't this create a, an incentive for small public administrations to wait for somebody else to do it and then get it for free? Well, uh, yes and no, meaning that if you, if you have something that you need, usually, usually actually uh, what happens is the other way around. So you recreate the same software over and over because you believe that what is there uh, until now is not really good or not exactly satisfying your needs. Uh, I don't think that this model changes very much this. Uh, because <laughs> this was kind of the way it was until now. You have still Article 68 and Article 69 are older than our team, are older than this collaborative model. It's just a framework that was already present uh, on which we are working. So in theory, already now, this could have been a problem because uh, all public administrations are obliged to give to somebody else the software if they, if they ask for it for free. So, and this is not a problem that is arising. So yes, in theory, it, this is a problem, what you're quoting. But in practice, ah, it, it didn't really show up. And actually, we need to encourage more of this participation and more of this maintenance of the same software. I have? Hmm? Small budget to hire developers, but when they 
know that another group is working on a project, they can allocate their budget to that group. And then by pooling that money, two or three or four developers can be paid to get the work done, whereas the municipality itself would have <coughs> complete 5% of the work. So that was their disincentive from actually starting. So the reason this doesn't happen is because you land up with people working across departments. Or just not at all, because my department has 5% of what I really need to hire a human, so I just won't hire the human. But when I can give the budget to somebody else and then they can create a pool of funds and have someone manage that developer team, it happens much more quickly. Yeah, no, absolutely. But this is more or less experience we saw, so I mean, it's. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the question was for, for, for the internet speakers. Um, um, he was uh, speaking about his experience in the Dutch government where uh, the bigger problem was to convince the manager layer that um, you, you had to, uh, like that if you do something as open source then it benefits everybody and not just the people who are funding you, then this is a problem and then how to educate them not to, um, like that open source is not that much more expensive so you should do open source in general because it's better. Does it sum it up? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It had to be a quick summary. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, it, it actually read five minutes left, so no, time's yeah. off. <laughs> no, 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 you have five minutes left for questions. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, well, in Italy we are in a luckier situation because they have to release it as open source. So you can kind of avoid the question in this way. But in general, I would say that leading by example is always the best practice. So in, in a way we are doing that also in Italy by trying to be an example in Europe and try to put it as a, as a, as a reform point uh, for all the other governments to try to see and enjoy. Because I, I, be, I honestly believe that not only Italian, uh, but this, this is a personal belief, that not, not only Italian institutions should participate in this kind of, of effort. As I was quoting before, the French government has also released uh, very good open software which can be adapted and used in other countries. So if we, of course there will be some software which will be just for a nation or just to comply with a particular law or just like a design choice, uh, for example, for the, the, web, the, the web toolkits. Uh, but otherwise, there should be <coughs> should be created, I think, a much more uh, wide collaboration platform where where these things can go and, and and evolve. Of course, sometimes it's quite hard to just convince the the management. Uh, another uh, problem that we had many times is well, but if I open open it up, then it's less secure, which is of course not exactly the case. But then y you need to talk them through it, and and what we have seen working is that often. Best practices really help, and we try to apply them in our work also because it's not really nice to go to somebody and say, "Well, you have to do it anyways." You know, it's because I, I'm the, I'm the boss or I'm the one who is putting down the guidelines. So it's always better to convince them and to have them convinced that opening things up is a good way. It takes a little bit of effort. Uh, for example, one of the things we tried first is to have the ticketing system be part be put on the open. And then uh, uh, having like all of this uh, uh, work gone, and then you create a workflow, and then you they're very very scared at first, and then they see that it's actually good, and they start to receive a uh, good quality contribution. Uh, and another example is uh, with the the agency is called uh, Polygraphico, which creates the the identity cards. Uh, they had a middleware for uh, reading the cards, and so you could build your own application. You could uh, have it as an authorization mechanism for your office, or for the gym, or for the buses, but it was Windows only. Um, we managed to have it released as open source. 
for the hackathon uh, just two days before. And during the hackathon, somebody took it and converted it uh, for and ported it to Arduino. Uh, so now everybody could use just an Arduino and all Italian citizens, <coughs> not all of them, because they need a new ID card. But more and more uh, Italian citizens in the next 10 years, the rollout will be complete, hopefully also sooner. Uh, <coughs> you can just create your authorization mechanism with that. And so they saw it, this as a real, real good value. And this is when they start to understand the power of open source and of opening things up. Because they can start to, re to receive contribution, they have immediate feedback, and so on. So yeah, best practices, to, to put it short. OK, uh, wait, I, I'll just go in order, because and I'll try to keep the answers short. Yeah. I saw some hands there, since a lot of time, but I don't see them anymore. So no, we'll one go one. one. OK, good. Okay, so uh, the question was about uh, this is uh, um, this is more about open source and not about hacking. Uh, what I can tell you, the, par the, the hacking part, if I understand your question correctly, is about the the, the platforms which are open and uh, let's say an API first approach, where all the government agencies and all the services are exposed first via APIs. So you can build your own applications. Well, this is of course a very very broad answer because you get all kind of APIs and all kind of system. Uh, but to give, you, to give you an example, the data and analytics framework will collect all of the data from all public administrations. And then you have a central interface to analyze it, and it's the only source of truth because it's where like you get real-time feed. It's not like an open data portal where somebody just n go needs to go and upload a, a, a CSV file every now and then when they remember, but it just like has live feed from the, the, data, it, the, the data directly. And then, of course, depending on the access level policies, uh, you can go and analyze it. And for all the data sets that are opened by law, uh, then you can just uh, create uh, your account, a login, and then you have a Jupyter notebook with all of the data directly inside, and you can do your analysis, and you can publish them for others to see. So in this case, if you're an activist or a journalist or a citizen who wants to do some dashboarding, uh, you can do it easily in this kind of framework. Uh, the, the, the electronic ID card is another example. Uh, where you can build your tools and, and devices and authorization with that. Yes. Last can I take the last question very quickly? Take the last question and because we're Brian. Can we get set up for this? You, you come on, set up, and yes, go ahead and do your okay. last question. And we'll talk about the first one. Please. My question, uh, can you explain a little bit more about Article 68? Do you have uh, an upcoming presentation in Greenland? Uh -huh. Okay, so the question were. Uh, That's a very long answer, and I'm going to ask that you keep talking about all that. We, we will do that. We will do that. But in general, yes, Article 68 is already working. We already have examples. And yeah. Yes, I guess. Okay. Really quick, I really appreciate <laughs> all of you being here. Thank you very much. Yeah.